Why did United's game plan fail? How did City eventually dominate the game? What exactly was the fundamental issue for United? And more broadly, what is going wrong at Manchester United? I'm going to be answering all of these. And in the later part of the video, I'll also be reacting to some of Gary Neville's comments as well. But before I go any further, for cheap, good quality football jerseys, retro jerseys and tracksuits, go over to www.jerseyfever.com. I myself have bought a number of different jerseys from Jersey Fever, including this 2003-2004 Manchester United shirt with Ronaldo on the back and this one's probably my favorite so if you want a shirt like this be sure to click the link in the description below and use code Atlantis football with a space to get 5% off. So from the start of the game we saw United pressing in a vertically and horizontally compact 4-4-2 shape which would become a 4-2-4 when United looked to press City aggressively in their defensive third with Pogba and Fernandes leading the press as one would pressurise the City centre-backs with the other cutting the passing lane into Rodri. Now in the first part of the game United were relatively successful in pressing City and stopping them playing out into the middle third as easily. However City's backline and Edison in particular are so good at just being able to bypass the whole press with one pass over the top of United's front line and so United weren't able to consistently stop City and so we would see United eventually drop off into a narrow 4-4-2 shape in the middle third when this happened. City were using a 2-3-2-3 shape in the defensive third with Bernardo Silva and Kevin De Bruyne being positioned high up between the lines in behind Fred and McTominay in the half space. And we would also see Phil Foden playing the role of a false nine dropping into the space directly between Fred and McTominay. And this did remind me a lot of how Pep Guardiola deployed Lionel Messi from around 2010 to about 2012. And if you want to see more on the false nine role and potentially how Phil Foden will develop, then check out the video I did on how Barcelona beat Real Madrid 5-0 in 2010. That video will be linked below. In the middle third, we would see City switching from a 2-3-5 to a 3-2-5 shape, depending on whether Kyle Walker decided to hold a deeper position in a back three or push forward down the right side. With three players in between United's high midfield line and defensive line, City's objective in position was to work the ball into one of these three and have them turn and carry the attack forward. Lindelof and Maguire chose to stay in the defensive line, which was probably the best option, but this would then give Foden, Silva and De Bruyne the space to turn when they received the ball. However, despite a good start, within five minutes, United's defensive system had crumbled. We see here that City had the ball in front of United's defensive shape, and Bernardo Silva is positioned right next to McTominay. As the ball gets shifted out to Cancelo, Bernardo Silva sees a potential passing lane open up and drifts off of McTominay. McTominay doesn't realise until Cancelo has played the pass, but still from this position there's not massive concern, but down the left side United are far too passive with their defending. McTominay doesn't get close enough to Grealish and when Bernardo Silva receives the ball, neither McTominay, Wambasaka or Lindelof were able to stop the cross, which is a major issue. But also prior to this in the box, Lindelof got drawn out to the flank when there's no need for him to leave that position. He doesn't stop the cross either and now you're left with a situation where Maguire needs to either make a decision which should be to push out to Foden as that is the imminent danger and then call either Sancho or Tellers to cover him in behind but there seems to be no communication at all in United's box and what should happen is Tellers moves on to De Bruyne as soon as Grealish receives the ball on the left and then calls Jadon Sancho to cover the space where Mahrez is. The ball then evades Foden which is quite lucky for Maguire but it falls for De Bruyne who's in a massive amount of space and within five minutes United are behind. But the game wasn't over at this point. United still looked pretty good initially in possession. We saw them drop into a 2-3-1-4 shape in the build-up phase with McTominay as that deep single pivot. But in the middle third, that was more of a 2-4-4 with Fred dropping alongside him and Pogba and Fernandes ahead playing as an advanced double pivot, almost as a double force nine. Now I think what United were trying to do was what Tottenham did against City, which is to win the ball back and then look for a quick vertical pass from those deeper positions into an advanced central player between the lines, which for Tottenham was Harry Kane and for United was either Pogba or Fernandes, and then looking for a quick pass in behind to find one of the runs of the wide attackers, which for Tottenham was Son or Kulusevski and Ilanga or Sancho for Manchester United, in order to exploit City's extremely high back line, which was the right idea in my opinion. And this was successful as it did work out for the goal. Wambasaka played a dink pass to bypass the City pressure and then Alanga's layoff was perfect for Fernandes to play a first time pass into Paul Pogba who like Harry Kane for Tottenham is positioned in between the lines of the City system and from here Jadon Sancho makes exactly the right run. Pogba's pass is played to perfection and when Sancho comes inside Rodri has to do more to stop Sancho coming further inside into that shooting position but it's the individual brilliance from Sancho to create the shooting opportunity 
penalty and then to bury it in off the post into the far corner and that gets United level. In the first 15 to 20 minutes the game wasn't following the pattern that you would have expected with both sides having relatively the same amount of possession and both looking dangerous when in the final third but the main problem for United frankly is the individual talent in the side. Whilst I do think that Lindelof has been pretty good for United over the past few weeks he commits a terrible error when he rather uncharacteristically throws himself at the ball well over committing allowing Foden to just flick the ball over his head and it's a great initial save from De Gea from Foden's shot but then when the ball ricochets out for some unknown reason Maguire allows the ball to go through his legs as though he's dumbing it for someone for who I don't know why he doesn't just clear the ball out for a corner is beyond me and then from here United are just at the mercy of City and after a block shot the ball falls for De Bruyne who puts it into the back of the net and City have restored their lead. And this goal just sums up United defensively at the moment. It's unexplainable really. There's no logic apart from that individually United's defenders seem to be consistently error prone with Lindelof and Maguire both being at fault for the two opening goals. But despite scoring in the first half, United didn't create much of substance. And that applied throughout the whole match as they finished with an XG of just 0.36 compared to City 2.74, which shows the issues clearly. The best way of creating against City for United was by looking for runners in behind and they created one of their best chances other than the goal and Bruno Fernandes made a run between City centre-backs and Lindelof found his run with a fantastic long pass. Fernandes controls it in the box and the ball eventually finds its way out to Paul Pogba who plays a very good pass into Fred inside the box. And as the ball falls here for Fernandes, he has to play this pass first time into Sancho and then he's got a clear cut chance. But for some reason he delays with a touch and when the ball does eventually find its way to Sancho, the angle is closed down and his shot goes well over the bar. But I thought Fernandes was pretty poor in this game and has been for recent weeks. His long passing from deep was off and he seemed to not have the decisiveness in the final third to pick the right pass. Although to be fair to Fernandes he did have a role in United's goal and in the first 10 minutes he was able to feed a ball into Fred inside the box who managed to dribble past Walker but Edison did well to come out and make the block. Also if you do like the look of these phone cases I'll leave the link in the description below. Anything you buy will help support the channel. My personal favourite is the Ronaldo Sue celebration one even though I do also like the Fergie one as well but be sure to go over to the site linked in the description they've got a lot of other designs as well and if you use code af at checkout you should get 25 percent off as well so united's best opportunities pretty much all came within the first 25 minutes and after city got their goal they began to control possession a lot more pushing united back into their defensive third though city also began to press a lot more aggressively higher up the pitch as the first half went on initially we saw them sitting in their 4-2-3-1 with only really foden applying the pressure in united's defensive third but midway through the first half we saw City pushing up as a unit and City are very good at cutting off the passes centrally with the wide attackers Morris and Grealish in this game sitting narrow to prevent the pass going into Fred or McTominay and force United out to the fullbacks in a position where it's easier for City to press as they can shift across and condense the space and this was extremely successful at stopping United firstly being able to play out their defensive third and secondly stopping them retaining possession at all though United certainly didn't help themselves. And this is because United's deeper players in the system are just not good enough on the ball. See, when we look at City and their ability in possession, most people tend to focus on the front five. However, their ability to not just keep possession for sustained periods, but also how they play out of pressure and then progress the ball forward comes mostly from their back five and Rodri. This is because every player in that City back five or six if you want to include Edison is an exceptional passer as well as being very good in terms of their ball control under pressure and so even if City are pressed high they're able to move the ball out of their defensive third which is why they're able to dominate possession. United on the other hand don't even have players who you describe as reasonably good in possession. Lindelof is a very good ball playing centre back and Tellers as well I would say is reasonably good in these areas. But David De Gea's kick in is shoddy, Maguire is a good long passer and can drive out with the ball but often takes far too long on the ball and isn't mobile enough to drive or dribble out of pressurised situations. Both McTominay and Fred are just sitting ducks in possession, mostly receiving the ball, taking one too many touches, which just invites pressure, and then not having the forward passing ability to play out of the press, and instead resorting to a pass backwards or sideways, which is simply just shifting the pressure onto someone else, and Wambasaka is probably the biggest liability out of everyone on the ball, moving like a duck stuck in oil, unable to quickly move with the ball, and being the main player who leads to the play breaking down, and City were content to just sit narrow and force the ball out to him every time, but they would then inevitably win the ball back in a few seconds. 
In comparison, City's backline and even Edison are just so elegant in possession and it's almost impossible to press them, which makes a massive difference in games like this. And I think United's lack of quality on the ball in deep areas was the catalyst for most of their other failings in the game. As if United could have played out more often, they would have had more space in behind City's midfield to work the ball into, and therefore more opportunity to get the ball in behind City's back line. Instead, for large proportions of the first half and pretty much the whole game, City would press United and there would would be a turnover within a matter of seconds, allowing City to sustain periods of dominance and pushing United further and further out of the game. The second half was really painful to watch from a Manchester United point of view. Going into half-time, United had recorded an XG of just 0.27, but by full-time, that was just 0.36, meaning that throughout the whole second half, United recorded an XG of just 0.07 which is incredibly low, something you'd expect to see from maybe a Burnley or a Watford against Manchester City. City were able to dominate possession in their 3-2-5 shape and just wear United down gradually. Mahrez would add a third with a fantastic volley from a corner, slotted into the bottom corner before he would then add a fourth later on in the game. And Mahrez showed the difference that top quality players can make, as did De Bruyne, Bernardo Silva and Phil Foden. And the uncomfortable truth for Manchester United fans is that the reason United aren't competing with Liverpool City, whilst without doubt being down to Solskjaer at the start of the season and Ranić now to a degree, is fundamentally down to their lack of quality. United have spent almost as much as City and more than Liverpool, I think, in the last three or four years. I haven't got the exact figures, but have completely wasted literal hundreds of millions of pounds on overrated players who maybe look like good signings on paper, but never had the potential to be world-class talents. The other week I spent £10 on a pint in London, and even if it was £20, it still would have been better value for money than Maguire or Wan-Bissaka for £130 million. If we are honest, I don't even think wan would get ahead of Matty Cash in Aston Villa's side. And if offered Maguire, I think Wolves and Southampton would just laugh in your face. McTominay and Fred would need upgrading if they were West Ham's midfield double pivot. And frankly, players like Lingard and Rashford aren't even good enough to be United's backup players at the moment. They've declined that much. Even though we want to point the finger at someone now for United's current problems, the real issues date back to 2019-20, when Solskjaer had his first summer transfer window. United have essentially wasted their entire project by being lazy in the transfer window, identifying the most obvious targets as though they had no scouting team in place at all. And a lot of the fans will blame the owners, but given the same power, a lot of people would have spunk the money just as quickly. When Donny van der Beek was signed, a lot of people criticised the video I made, which I'll try to put in the description below, where I said he was a good player, but not what United needed. People seemed to convince themselves that he was a deeper line playmaker who could play in a double pivot, which he wasn't at all, without actually being logical and isolating themselves from the situation and instead just looking at it like they were Manchester United fans excited at a new player coming. When wan Saka and Maguire were signed, there wasn't that many people questioning it. I thought both players were massively overpriced and to be fair, I didn't even see Maguire's decline coming so rapidly. I thought he was overpriced but he may do an alright job but wan Saka was never anywhere near the level of Trent or Cancelo despite a lot of deluded fans trying to make the case that he was. Even players like Bailly, Martial and Matic, they should have been moved on a long time ago but United have fallen into the same trap that Arsenal fell in where instead of having the standards of winning the title standards begin to drop and fans are more concerned about the success of individual players than they are with the club as a whole. So over the past few weeks Cristiano Ronaldo has come under significant criticism and it is partly justified with his finishing being very hit and miss recently but to pin United's whole failures on him is absolutely absurd. Without Ronaldo this season United first of all would not be in the Champions League and second of all probably wouldn't even be in the race for the top four. Without doubt he has declined significantly underperforming his non-penalty XG this season scoring seven non-penalty goals from an XG of 11.8, an underperformance of 4.80 goals. However, that's not the sole reason United have been dropping points. Fernandes, Sancho and Marcus Rashford have missed big chances in front of goal in recent weeks, and it seems like everyone in United's attack has hit a drought in front of goal at the same time. But a bigger issue comes from players like Maguire, Wan-Bissaka, Luke Shaw, McTominay and Fred who have been nowhere near the standard United need this season. I also think that many fans are holding Ronaldo to a completely unrealistic standard. When judging Ronaldo's form now, they seem to be reverting back to his time at Real Madrid and judging him in accordance with that. But Messi and Ronaldo have both declined, which is not really a criticism, it's just naturally what's going to happen as they get, uh, get older. Ronaldo's now 37, so to still consider Ronaldo as probably even being United's main player 
to being one of the best players in the world is pretty unrealistic. I think the way United should be looking at Ronaldo is still a very important part of the team, but he can't be the um, be-all and end-all. It can't just be down to Ronaldo to win Manchester United games, as it has been for pretty much the whole season so far. When Ronaldo doesn't perform, United don't perform. And even though Ronaldo can be criticised in regards to the full season, if you look at the big games, individual games, he's actually still performed. He won United the game against Tottenham. In the Champions League, pretty much, I think it was four of the six games, he scored the winning goal or at least scored a goal in those games to get United through. So I think the people who are saying that because of Ronaldo, United are um, failing this season are just people who, who don't really watch Manchester United games. It's just lazy analysis. They need... Um, a quick point to like pick out and they see Ronaldo un underperforming and so they just latch onto that. Um, if you actually watch Manchester United's games uh, throughout this whole season, you'll see that first of all, it's not even just the offensive problems, it's defensively as well. And even the offensive problems aren't really stemming from Ronaldo, it's coming from the midfielder lack of creativity. And even if Ronaldo is underperforming up front, that isn't the catalyst behind why United are failing this season. So now let's come on to what Gary Neville and some of the other Sky pundits had to say after the game. Of course he's in trouble. I think Ranić, to be honest with you, is probably... He could really unload on, I think, a few of them in that dressing room. I think there's big problems in there. I don't think he's telling... I know he's being honest as he can be in those interviews after the game, but I don't think he's telling us half I, I, the I don't think I, I don't think the players would, would be scared of Ranić. I don't think he holds that sort of... You know, I, I don't look at him and think I'll, I'll be scared scared of him. But it's not because he's being scared of him, is yeah, it? Yeah, but he's having the authority. When you're a manager, you're, you're supposed to have authority. Well, I, don't, don't... I don't look at him. His best work has been done behind the scenes. He's I, good at what he does. I, 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 it, comes to, it comes to Man United. Michael, I tell you yeah. what Roy says before, but you know, if Ralph rangnick has got a two-year consultancy and he's going to pick the next manager, would you not think that he's going to pass on the information of how you've been with him? Yeah, but no, it's, they won't it's, care it's, about that. I don't think, I don't no. think the, the modern day. If they don't care about yeah. that, there's a bigger problem than even I think. Who's going to pick the players then? Is that going to give Randy that responsibility? No, I would have thought, to be fair, that the, the, the chief scout, sporting director, new manager coming in will pick the players. But you imagine that what he's doing at this moment in time is information gathering. Mm. He's coming here with a five month contract, six month contract, with a view to consulting for the club in the next two years on restructuring the club in terms of appointing a new manager. He's going to pass on the information. If there's players chucking it in, so I completely agree with what Gary Neville is saying here. Firstly, there are big problems in United's dressing room that have remained even after Solskjaer sacking. And secondly, in response to Mika's question of Ranić's authority, I don't see how Ranić is not going to have some influence over United's transfer strategy when the next manager comes in. He's been given a two-year consultancy deal and appears to have some kind of say over who the next manager will be. So I can't imagine that the players who aren't performing now or have attitude problems are going to have a completely blank slate when the new manager comes in. I think Gary's analysis of Ranić's appointment as information gathering is spot on, and you'll see the argument that Mika Richards makes against this. Yeah, but Gary, he has, all, he has, he has, he has, he has all his credibility has gone. Like, if, if, if he come in as a manager and doesn't do well, he would have to win something. And he might win something. We have to win the league. Now he's going to go upstairs and all these credibility as a manager is, is going to go out well, the Michael, window. He, he should have come in, in the back room. His job for the last five, six, seven years has been working in, in, in that type of role. He's, yeah, not, he's not been a coach. So my point is he's more suited to that role. So why bring, why bring him in as a coach? Well, I suspect they've they brought him in as a short term. They, they had to change the coach. They've changed the coach. Five, five months they've got to the end of the season. They've thought, well, this guy's going to come in and do our sort of restructuring of the behind the scenes. And we'll actually put him in for five months, get us to the end of the season, view the club from the inside, in the dressing room, see what the players are like and see who comes on the bus for next season. But, I don't think it's the worst. Gary, when he comes in, he, he, fair enough, he comes in, you're thinking he can bring one or two of his staff in. But some of the staff that were with Ollie, Mickey Phelan, Dan Fletcher, Dan's a technical director. Director, they asked him a few weeks ago, the manager, what's Dan Fletcher doing? We on the bench. He said, I'm not really sure. So that tells you where the problems lie at the football club. I mean, he, no, one he knows did, that, no one's got defined roles at the club. He did say, suggest, again, with a twinkle in his eye on Friday, Ralph Rangnick, that he could still recommend himself as the manager. Yeah, that's not going to happen, Dave. He's not the manager of Manchester United next season. I can absolutely, categorically tell you that here now. And that's nothing, that's not because he's doing a bad job. He's just not being the manager of Manchester So United why give him the is. manager's job in the first place? Because they it's, couldn't no, get it the man manager they wanted. It doesn't matter. We're, we're talking, we're we're Micah, we're talking Micah, about the here and now. Micah. We're talking about it. So no, you're just, you just getting, rid of, you're, you're, getting rid of this season then? Is that what you're doing? You're getting rid of the season? You're ranting emotionally with, with, without any real sort of 
making sense. OK, so what... Ch Chelsea have appointed interim managers to the end of the season just to get them to the end yeah, of the season United, when the manager that just, they want becomes yeah, but available. Just because just you're connected to Man United, no, Man United doesn't mean that, that my opinions are relevant. No, it's not. It's Radnick, not. Radnick, what, Radnick's best work done? is done, done behind the scenes. Okay, you, brought, you brought him in as interim what, and he's not done great. What he's he losing all credibility. Then he's going upstairs and a new manager, you think a new manager is going to listen to... Stop ranting. What should they have done? Gone, gone for Conte. I really sh I, well, Conte was available before he went to Spurs. He was the best available manager at the time. They didn't and because want, it doesn't fit what the Man United way. The Man United way, you don't win the trophies no more. Conte's Conte. a winner. He's come from Inter Milan. And, 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 and why, why would you not want... You don't want winners now. Him. Is that where Man United are? You don't no, want winners want anymore. Him. They didn't want him. So why didn't, what? I agree with you, they don't want him. Conte's not a manager for Manchester United. Why, why is he not? He's why, not why is he not? He comes in for one or two years, he does a great job. No but he wins. He, he wins. wins. He, he wins. Win. Does he? So do you want to be so mediocre for the, for the, for the next they, ten years? Is that there, what you want? They've been there with Jose Mourinho. Right, they want to appoint either Pochettino or Ten Hag on a long-term project and they needed somebody to get to the end of the season. So here Mika Richards is saying a lot without actually saying that much at all. To condense his point, he's saying, why appoint Ranić if he's not going to be the manager next season? Which is a point that only makes sense if you don't understand the context around the situation. United want either Ten Hag or Pochettino, but after second Sol, sure they couldn't get either, which is why Ranić was the option. Now, Mika says that United should have gone with Conte because he was the best option available. But as Gary Neville points out, they didn't want Conte because of the short-termism around appointing him. So for once, the board actually made a calculated decision. Rather than appointing a manager who isn't first or even your second choice, appoint an interim like Ranić who is still going to have influence over the club after this season. It's not even really about whether you think Conte would have been a good fit for United, it's about United appointing the manager they want. If they had gone with another interim manager who is maybe a better manager than Ranić, then yes you would have had maybe more short term success this season which is still debatable, but then the manager would not have been incentivised to develop the team long term as he doesn't have any influence after this season. So what you may have saw is whilst United maybe would have got top four and performed better overall, when next season rolls around, the same problems are still there. And you then have a similar situation to the one that United found themselves in in the summer of 2019, when a good run of form has plastered over the real issues at the club. Could they actually take a leaf out of Arsenal's book, Manchester United, who and Arsenal the team that, that look like they are the biggest challenge to... United's Champions League place right now and take a bit of short-term pain. A couple of seasons finishing eight, they've dropped out of European competition, signed deliberately young players with a young coach they're trying to develop to see I think them Arsenal, move Man forward. United is different. Yeah. It's a different animal. Man United are one of the biggest clubs in the world, I think. Is that the problem though, Roy? Because they have to keep chasing short-term success. The spending power is different though, Dave, as well. The spending power of Manchester United is huge compared to Arsenal's. It's been, Gary, it's been the same as Manchester City. But is, is, is the okay, danger? Like, you, you, you've been Pochettino pretty much all the way through this. Now you're sort of leaning towards ten. No, know. they've got a real risk with Pochettino in that Paris Saint-Germain, not Roy saying about go and get him, but Paris Saint-Germain are one of, the, one of the clubs in the world that if they didn't want to let him go, they could just say, no, you're not going, you're staying here next season because you've done well for us this season. Now, if he gets knocked out of the Champions League, Pochettino, he could become available because Paris Saint-Germain's whole sort of model is around the Champions League. But if he wins the Champions League and he's done well with Neymar, Messi, obviously Mbappé may leave at the end of the season, they're going to say, no, you're not going anywhere, you're staying. I don't care what Manchester United have. They don't need the money, Paris Saint-Germain. So there could be an element of if they put all their eggs in one basket with Pochettino at the end of the season, they could end up managerless if Ten Hag goes somewhere else. That's why I feel like they'll get more certainty if they went for the Ajax. And it's a, and not a short term on the, on the pitch either. This is a, a long term. You got, Pogba's out of contract in the summer. I can't see the point in keeping him. I look at Marcus Rashford right now. I mean, if I was, I'd be thinking right now, if you're not getting in a game like this, the Gary Nainer centre forwards on there, I'd be looking to go as well. And it might be the best thing for him. Ronaldo? Maybe to have a change. Ronaldo, I don't think, could be in next year. He's not, you, know, you can't build a team around Ronaldo. He's been one of the greatest players the world's ever seen. He's not the future for Maynard. He's the young be man's Cavani team. Won't be next Cavani year. shouldn't be here next year. You need this. We're talking about so many different players. Is wan as a right back going to take Man United to the next level? Of course he isn't. Left backs There's I don't trust. Do, the centre backs I don't trust. Midfield players. If Man United don't finish in the top four, it makes it even more difficult to try and get to attract them. Do you think Ronaldo should be here next season? Yeah, I'd keep him. Yeah, unless he's up to no good. So this is the exact point I was making earlier. Take a leaf out of Arsenal's book. Why would you do that? Arsenal have had less success than United in recent seasons. They haven't even had success. They are only a position or two above United in the league. They aren't even challenging for anything and weren't even in Europe this season. Roy and Gary's complete dismissal of the statement is exactly what every United fan's reaction should have been to this question. United need to have the mindset of competing with Real Madrid, Manchester City, Liverpool, Barcelona, Bayern Munich, etc. And that means building a world-class 
squad. If you take Arsenal's route, you're only going to end up competing for fourth. United this summer need to go out and either get Pochettino or Ten Hag, whoever they want, and throw £200 million plus at the squad and ship out the Deadwood, because otherwise they're going to constantly be in a revolving door of building, looking like they could challenge, falling apart and then starting all over again. I will be doing a full video on who I would sign for United, who I would sell, and my thought process behind the transfer strategy. So if you want to see that, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications. I will be doing it for other clubs as well. My video on who I would sign for Arsenal is out now and will be linked below. Below.